glad that you showed up today. What a great day to be in the house of the Lord. God is good and all the time. Hopefully around you somewhere in your seat or close to you, you found one of these books. And if not, then you can scatter around when we dismiss and find one. They're laying around the pews and and uh, it's just a 30-day prayer guide, and I'll explain a little more about this as we walk through the message uh, this morning. But I want to thank you for being here and just wanted to acknowledge. How many of you also have a ping pong ball or two this morning, all right? You guys get those. If you didn't get one, there are some here at the front. You can get them at the end of the service. Um, how many of you, because this is kind of... Um, the word has got out that several of you feel like the reason that we have these is to throw them at me. All right? So this is what, why I have this display here so that I can throw them back at you. Now, hopefully that won't happen today. But if it did, it, it may be fun. I don't know. Not that I'm enticing you. Please don't misinterpret but uh, we have been walking through Hallmarks of Hallmarks. So if, if this is your first Sunday of the year here, we have spent the last two weeks walking through two of our core values. Today we're going to be uh, talking about one of the, the third core value. And, and then next week we will finish that. Next week, as I said, is Vision Sunday. We're going to be looking at the core value radical generosity. And because as we look at the annual budget, we look at what... God did through you and your giving last year, and we project what we feel like God is going to do with our budget for 2023. It's always exciting to look back, as Stephanie already mentioned, to see that God provides for his church, and God uses people to do that. And you, you guys have been radically generous for as long as, you, as Hallmark's been in existence. And so I'm, I'm proud of that. I'm thankful for that. So let me just give you our four core values. That way you may uh, kind of know where we're at today. The first one is, is biblically driven, then personally involved, radically generous, outwardly focused. This is kind of the way that I have memorized them, but really they're somewhat interchangeable. I would say that the, really the foundational piece of the hallmarks of Hallmark is number one, that biblically driven. Because I believe if you live a biblically driven life, if I live a biblically driven life, if our church then is biblically driven, the other three will fall into place. We will be personally involved, we will be radically generous, and we will be outwardly focused. Two weeks ago, we looked at outwardly focused as the first one, we were looking at this as we walked through them, and, and that was because we were uh, announcing that we were making a change in our name from Hallmark Baptist Church to Hallmark Church, and one of the core reasons to do that is because we want to we wanna be outwardly focused. We want to lead as many people as we can to find and follow Jesus. Last week then, we said, that, well, here's the foundation of that. We're, we're biblically driven. And we really landed on two statements last week. The, the two statements are, we have truth, and, and we believe that God has preserved his word for us. We have truth. This is how we should live. And, and if we have, uh, you know, we make this statement that we're not going to adjust the Bible to fit our lives, which is potentially what culture might say. We're going to adjust our lives to fit the Bible. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Biblically driven. Uh, and last week, we, the second statement we made is we, we need to live out the truth. Not, not only do we have the truth, but we need to live out the truth. And we looked at James chapter 1. If you want to turn to James chapter 1, you can turn there. It will be on the screen. But we looked at these few verses, James 1, 22 through 24. And James remembers the, the half-brother of Jesus James was not a believer or a follower of Jesus until after the death, the burial, and the resurrection. After Jesus came to life, back to life, then James was like, oh, I believe he's the Messiah, and he became a follower. So James chapter 1, verse 22, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he is like a man, observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man is. He was. So we were saying we want to know the truth, but more than that, we want to we live the truth. And James is saying that if you know the truth, but you don't live the truth, the picture he was giving us, it was as if you went into, you know, got up from your bed that morning, you looked into the mirror, your hair was going every which direction, and you're like, I don't care, I'm going to just go. Remember that conversation? 
and some of the people who are follically challenged, uh, we, were, we pointed them out. And then I, I asked you the question, should I show up today at church not combing my hair, leaving it like it was as I got up? And how many of you wished I would have done that this morning? Okay, very few, which is good. But I said, well, how about I just take a picture and show you? So do you, would you like to see? Okay, this, this is... Joy is a blessed lady, isn't she? <laughs> so blessed to wake up to that every single morning. I don't really know what to say. God is good. <laughs> yeah, maybe not all the time. I don't know. All right. I, I'm not sure if I can recover. So let's move on. Core value that we want to talk about today is personally involved. Right? We want to be involved. I love this statement. A friend of mine, Sean Sears, made this statement. He said, there are two ways Christians need to be personally involved. In the local church and then as the local church. Okay, and so there is opportunity within this church, within this body of believers to serve, whether that's kids ministry, whether that's running a camera, whether that's singing or playing a guitar, if you know how to sing and play guitar. And, and maybe it's just greeting people and handing out, you know, a green ping pong ball as you walked in this morning. There's a lot of ways that you can serve in the church. But more importantly, that is how can we serve as the church? That's maybe in your neighborhood. Maybe that's serving at the Fort Worth Pregnancy Center. And you, you may have been challenged as you watched that video this morning. I'm going to go sign up to, to help as the church. It's why every, every Sunday morning we walk out of here, we're reminded it's time to now go be the church, to live and to serve in the church, but to serve as the church. And so why, why do we do that? What does it mean to serve as the church? Turn over to Matthew chapter 28. Okay, Matthew 28. 28. Again, this will, will be on the screen as well. And I'm just, we're just walking through some familiar passage of Scripture this morning that really give us our mission, our vision, and our core values as a church. Matthew 28, starting in verse number 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And what we see in this passage of Scripture really is what we would term as the mission of the church. The mission of the church. That means all followers of Jesus. This is the mission. Jesus said before he ascended into heaven, where he now sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us, Jesus said, make disciples. That's the mission of the church, to make disciples. I love the definition Tony Evans gives. What is a disciple? It's a visible, verbal follower of Jesus. That that's the mission of the church. And then we think about, for us, Hallmark locally, what's, what's the vision of Hallmark? Obviously, to fulfill the mission. But we've kind of made this in a statement that help us to understand, to remember what, what, what is our purpose? What are we doing here? What's the vision of the church? It's simple to lead people to find and follow Jesus. We think about these words, find and follow. What we see in the words of Jesus, what is known as the Great Commission, is to make disciples. I want to find people. We're going to, we're going to reach the lost. That, that's the idea of finding. That's evangelism. I love the statement we have here. Find it means evangelism. And what does that mean? Sharing the gospel by public preaching and personal witness. And here's where we talk about personally involved. We can serve in the church, we can serve as the church, and the greatest thing we can do as a church member in serving as the church is to personally proclaim the gospel to people. Lead people to find and follow Jesus. It's not just about me standing up here on the stage giving the ABCs of salvation. We want to publicly do that as often as we can, correct? But it doesn't stop there. It's you in your neighborhood with your classmates, your teammates, the other soccer moms, whatever that might be, whatever is in your context, it's you personally proclaiming Jesus to people. Follow. Follow is the discipleship. Jesus said, go make disciples and then teaching them to observe all things I've commanded. This is equipping believers 
to be faithful followers of Jesus. I love the statement of Rick Warren. Pretty old. This statement. It says a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will make a great church. If you and I are committed to be personally involved in sharing the gospel with people, that's the mission. It's not hallmark the building leading people to find and follow Jesus. It's hallmark the people leading people to find and follow Jesus. And what I love about Hallmark is that this has been a core value of our church since it began. That we have not only done that locally, but this church has been involved globally. I'm, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that we don't just go across the street, we go across the country, we go across the world. Here's what we have to be careful with. That we stop going across the street and we just go across the world. Right? Jesus said in Acts, First Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the earth. And so I'm going to invite our team that went to Cambodia. I know Stephanie mentioned them earlier, and a few of them are going to come up and just share a little bit about their story that God allowed them. They just got back from Cambodia on Friday at 9 a.m. So if you don't know, they're 13 hours ahead there, and so they're ready for bed, right? So come on up. You guys can come on up. And would you give them a hand as they come and, and share a little bit about what God is, is using Hallmark to do uh, there in Cambodia. I think Mary's going first. Is that right, Mary? There you go. Hi, everyone. My name is Mary McLemore. Um, before I start my testimony, I just want to uh, teach you a greeting. Um, it's Susadai. Susadai means hello. Um, can you try it with me? He say Susadai. Okay, now we're going to put our hands together and bow. Okay, one, two, three. Susadai. Okay, good job. Y'all, I'm nervous. This is my first time speaking in front of y'all. <sighs> All right. Um, this was my first missions trip. It was also my first time flying internationally. So that was, I was nervous and excited um, to be flying and just be on an airplane for 31 hours or however many hours. Um, just our tush made it, our tushies. That was, that hurt, TMI, but that was, think before you fly a long time. Uh, Chad had a great, like, pillow. He's, he's got this flying down. <laughs> he did great. Um, uh, I prayed for, before the plane ride during and after for smooth flights and our time in Cambodia. I still didn't know what to expect. I just knew that we were going to be having a small version of EBS, uh, which I've done before, so not too hard. Our first day was in Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia, with Pastor Seahawk at the dump ministry, where they teach the kids how to read and write so they can get accepted into public school. They also feed the kids there and have church services. When we arrived, these kids greeted us as soon as we got out of the bus. There was a bunch of them. There was like 10, 13 just at, by the door as we went down the steps, just cheering and smiling and waving. We couldn't communicate, but I can see it in their eyes how grateful they were to see us and how happy they were that we could spend time with them. They were smiling from ear to ear and gave us big hugs as we left. At the end of every night, the team hung out in the lobby of our hotel and went around talking about our high, low, and, a, and buffalo that, of that day. A buffalo is something that was surprising or unexpected. Um, it helped me to reflect on each day because every day is something unexpected and wonderful that God helped me reflect on his goodness and love for all the people we met. I was surprised how these kids are so happy while not having much and living in, in a dump. Literally dumped trash everywhere and their parents are working through the trash to get some money to feed their families. But it encouraged me and hopefully it encourages you all not to take granted the big things and to cherish the little things like how much they cherish their school and their friends and the church. Um, 
And I just encourage you to pray for the kids and their families at the dump to accept Christ in their lives and that they can one day leave the dump. Pray for pastor, the pastors that we met, Pastor Seahawk, Pastor Lomer Hope, Dr. Castro, and Pastor Rhett, to feel encouraged and to keep the fire burning for Jesus. Hopefully you too will go to a missions trip. It doesn't have to be around the world or outside of Fort Worth, as long as you serve others and tell them about Jesus. Meditate on this verse. It's on our shirts. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? I said, here I am, send me, Isaiah 6, 8. There's so much more I've experienced and seen God's work, but there's just not enough time to share today. But if you want to know more, you can always come and ask me and we can talk, or you can always ask one of us who went on the trip. We would love to talk about what we've experienced and what we've seen and how God works. Thank you. Well done, Mary. You couldn't tell that was her first time, right? Uh, to continue her, <laughs> to continue her thought on sharing the highs, lows, and the surprises, uh, Rhonda and I were talking that this was probably the, the greatest, most impactful uh, mission trip of this type that we've been on. Uh, it was so incredible. There were many reasons for that. Some real high highs, the amazing team that came together through it, the um, welcoming of the, of the different folks that maybe we hadn't been around for a while, the Donovans, you know, Dave Winger and uh, his missions, or his uh, children's pastor was there as well. Uh, and then uh, we got to welcome getting to know very real Allison and uh, her daughter, <laughs> Uh, and her daughter Maddie. It was so, so neat uh, to be able to get to know them better. Uh, uh, all of that led by the uh, incredible Chad Morton. Uh, just, uh, you never would have thought that uh, this was his first MANA uh, mission trip to lead. Of course, he's been a veteran, if I could say that, Stephanie. They've been veteran missionaries for a long time. Uh, but it was such an incredible in way that he led the group. That was so wonderful. Uh, and then, of course, 3 John 4 says, uh, John said, I have no greater joy than to see my children walk in truth. And for us to be able to uh, be on this short-term mission trip with Jeremy and Mary and see God using them, um, yeah, children's not just little children, but your adult children as well, as so many of you know. It's tremendous joy to be able to see God using them uh, both here and far away. Those were some, some amazing highs that uh, we've had uh, on this trip. But also being able to see how God's working throughout all of those ministries. We got to visit eight different ministries. We got to see churches that your mission donations supported missionaries to go and plant churches there and we got to see churches that those churches then planted and we got to see those second generation churches planting other churches that's the biblical model those national pastors going out and spreading God's love and spreading God's word and the need for salvation amongst the people who worship millions of gods. And it's so powerful to see God working the way that he promised his model would work. But the greatest high of it was throughout those eight visits, those eight different ministries that we got to go to, and how the gospel was shared by our team numerous times. And we got to see 32 people raise their hands, children and adults, raise their hands, asking Jesus to save them. All of this happening in Cambodia. Many of you, when you hear the words Cambodia, you know, like me, you think about a country that's been ravished by war over the last 50, 60 years. United States having a part in that. 
And so when we get there, I'm thinking, you know, what are we going to uncover? How difficult is this going to be? And then as Mary said, there's so much happiness in the kids. It, living in a dump, going through trash and garbage and you know, just to be able to get something to recycle and sell. And yet the happiness is there and they're welcoming us. And uh, that was such a surprise to me. But that's how God changes hearts, taking impoverished hearts and giving them a hope, hope that others don't have. And we were so grateful for that. That was a huge surprise. Uh, another surprise was, frankly, a, a disappointment. A, a low part in the trip for me was when I yielded to peer pressure. I usually don't yield to peer pressure, um, but I, I thought on this trip I was going to have a, uh, a partner whose palate is similar to mine. Meat and potatoes are just fine. You know, I live vicariously through Rhonda's uh, journey and trying different foods and things like that. Um, but Allison just weakened on me. Uh, and when everybody around us seemingly, you know, Chad is eating a tarantula whole thing and Jeremy eating the tarantula whole thing, followed by the dessert of a cricket, a big almost locust. Uh, and then the support team trying to, trying to get us to eat it. And so I yielded and I pulled off a leg and ate it. And, and it's a good thing that we were on our way to Dr. Castro's clinic and hospital because that leg got stuck in my throat and I thought I was going to need a trachea, tracheotomy. And it, it, folks, do not yield to that peer pressure, right? It was horrible. I don't care what, how much garlic got put on it. It was bad. Uh, but the lowest of lows was having to say goodbye. I mean, say goodbye as we left each of the ministries and those kids are just loving on us and the adults are so welcoming of us. Having to say goodbye to Jerry and Kristen who, as you support them, are there finding ways to continue to reach unreached people groups. Folks, they're older than I am. That's saying something. <laughs> who said wow? <laughs> And at, uh, in their young 60s, it's young, right? They're just continuing having to say goodbye to Dave Winger and his minister, his uh, children's minister, um, Brett. I almost forgot his name because uh, Brett means something differently or sounds like something differently in Khmer, uh, the Cambodian language. And so he went by Fred and all kinds of different names. But having to say goodbye to them, having to um, say goodbye to folks that uh, you love being able to work around and work with and in that way. So that was really tough. Uh, and so I just wanted to thank you for those of you who provided uh, financial support and prayer support uh, to, so that this group could go. For those of you who have supported missions uh, in general, who supported MANA you know, specifically, who supported the Donovans for a long time, who supported the Mortons, you know, we are so, so grateful for you uh, because God is doing amazing things you know, with your donations, with your sacrifices through MANA, through these missionaries, uh, and you are partnering with them. And so thank you so much for that. And for those of you who took care of those that we left behind, um, I understand that, uh, that Gwen Ader just had meals every night. Uh, she didn't get the word out far enough, I guess, but... Uh, uh, and for those of you who checked on my mother-in-law, she's she was still up and going when we got home. So thank you so much for all your support. We love you guys so much. All right. Good morning. It's hard to put these past 11, 11 days into words and on a time limit because there's so much. And then we probably should have talked about our stories because we might overlap. But um, this was my first mission trip overseas. And my first MANA Worldwide trip, being on staff as a children's director at Hallmark for over nine years, 
I've known about manna. I've taught the kids about manna worldwide. We've prayed for manna. We've talked about nutrition centers. But to get to experience a manna worldwide trip firsthand was incredible. To be able to see with my own eyes eight different ministries going on in Cambodia and to hear the pastors and kids they say thank you was something I will never forget. I'm so thankful for Chad Morton. He led our team so well, made sure that we drank our water, nagged us to drink our water, made sure we experienced many different ministries and tarantulas, and provided us with many laughs when we needed the laughs. So thanks, Chad. I was not sure how I was going to go on this trip. When I felt the Lord calling me to go, I tried to think of every excuse possible to say no, but he kept providing and proving me wrong. It was very clear that he wanted me to go. As excited as I was, I was also living in fear. In fact, the night before we left, I couldn't sleep, sat up, told my husband that I wasn't going to go. I can't do it. I'm not going. But once again, I heard God say, I am with you always. I will be with you every step of the way. Just trust me. So as we, the next day as we got on that plane, there was an overwhelming sense of peace and calm after we had a little issue with the couldn't check on our, we had a, we couldn't carry on our carry-ons way checks. We might have been a little bit bitter, but anyway. Um, this experience was just extra special for me because my daughter Maddie was able to go. And when she first mentioned wanting to go, um, I was hesitant. I kind of maybe talked her out of it a little bit. But once again, God provided not only financially, but knowing that she would only miss one day of school and she got the okay immediately from her college and her volleyball coach. They told her to go. And as a staff kid sometimes, or a lot of times, I ask her to jump in or, hey, I need you to come serve. I need you to do this. Um, she's at everything. Uh, um, you know, she didn't want to be. She always had to go everything. But for her to ask to go on her own, wanting to serve him, was a proud moment for me. We've, Michael and I have prayed for our kids. Um, Carlos and I, part of the family ministry, we pray that as families that you guys will disciple your children and lead them to go and follow him. And so we pray that she would serve him as she grew older, and she did this. Watching her interact with the kids and even the adults and even with the team, she, she was the youngest, but she fit right in there. Uh, she was able to use her love of volleyball to connect with a group of kids, and they had a full game going at one point. Uh, for her, her favorite part was taking the orphans out to dinner. She made an amazing connection with a little girl named Grace. And there were a lot of tears that night when we had to say goodbye to Grace. In fact, the next day she was already writing our letter and making sure it got delivered to her. One of the things that stood out to me on this trip was the joy that Jesus brings to people. That joy is universal. The first place we went to was the dump site ministry, like they shared, a, past, a ministry of Pastor Seahawk. He wants to educate those first and second graders so that they can get out of that dump and break that cycle. These kids literally have nothing. This day was probably one of the hardest to see. Driving up, I was in tears after driving through the village and seeing what little they had. But before we could step off that bus, we were surrounded by kids waving and smiling. They hugged us as we got off the bus, complete strangers, but they knew what we had in common, and that was Jesus. Even with the language barrier, the smiles and hugs and singing all brought us together. Babies weren't wearing diapers, kids were hungry and hot, but yet they came to sit and hear about Jesus. They didn't complain. As they left, they were handed a bottle of water and a breadstick, and they were so thankful for that tiny snack, which would possibly be their only meal for the day and maybe the next day. It stuck out to me right then how Jesus changes people, and no matter your circumstance, he always gives us joy and hope. I knew I would walk away from this trip feeling blessed with what I have, but I was more convicted about the lack of joy I sometimes have, how I can go to the neg negative and think of the worst possible scenarios instead of just trusting Jesus and his plan. Here were moms and kids who couldn't afford food or diapers, who were rummaging every day through trash to find food or items recycled so that they could make money just to buy a simple piece of food, but you would never know it. They were rich in love, for one another and for Jesus. We didn't come to them that day bringing them gifts, money, or food. We just sat with them and gave them our time and our presence. It's so true there and here how we need relationships, and interaction, and fellowship with other believers to grow in him. Like Mary said, every night our team would get together and share their high, low, and buffalo for the day. 
What amazed me was that every, even though we all experienced the same things, our answers were different. Many nights, none of us had lows, and if we did, it was small things like missing Mexican food or the heat, but God was teaching each of us, even though we experienced the same things, different things on the trip. For me, it was being flexible and being confident. I'm a planner and an organizer. As much as we had planned for this trip, every day was different and brought unexpected things. What we planned, we just had to throw it out the window. Teaching kids about Jesus while being translated was a new experience for me. It was humbling. I couldn't be nervous. I had to be confident, be me, and use the gift that God has given me and trust him. At one of the VBSs, we were told to plan on around 30 to 40 kids. As we started, we had about 40. We got crafts ready. And then all of a sudden, a big group of kids, all in uniforms, came in. We had almost 80. They were on their way to school and skipped to come to our VBS. We didn't think we would have enough crafts because of the extra kids, but once again, God provided. Every child was able to walk away with a craft, and 11 kids gave their life to Jesus that day. I could share something about each day, but we'll be here forever. Um, but I want to thank those who financially gave to our trip so we could go, and thank each of you for praying for us as we went. God's hand was evident throughout this whole trip. There was no flight issues, no lost luggage, no delays, no major illnesses. God's working in a mighty way in Cambodia through these amazing pastors and kids. We know of 31 salvations for sure. I want to challenge you to share the joy you have in Jesus with everyone through not only your words, but your actions and your face. If you and your neighbor didn't speak the same language, would they still be able to see Jesus in you? Thank you. Great job. Thank you. That was awesome. I, I would uh, echo if you have never been on a trip or maybe you have, there's always another one coming and a great opportunity to experience something new, but, but to share the love of Jesus somewhere else. Uh, we're going in June to Kenya, actually, and so uh, thankful for all of you and your faithfulness. Because of the faithfulness of this church, people can go. And, and I'm, I'm thinking about the Pastor Seahawk, you heard that name mentioned. Uh, if you don't know who he is, his picture kept showing up, and some of you know who Pastor Seahawk is. But um, almost 20 years ago, uh, Pastor Haley at the time uh, encouraged you to give money to pay the dowry so Pastor Seahawk, I hate to use that word, could buy his wife. <laughs> That's pretty cool, isn't it? That we were able to bless him and now he has several kids. It's just, that's what I love about Hallmark is if you stay around long enough, you're going to realize that this church has been generationally radically generous. Generationally, it's been personally involved. Generationally, we see that God continues to use this place, not just here, but all over the world. And I want to think about what Allison said. She mentioned something about your neighbor right there at the end. It's one thing for us to get on a plane and go 30 hours across the country and share through a translator the gospel of Jesus. And it's scary sometimes and there's culture shock and you come back and you're struggling with what time is it, what day is it, I can't sleep or I can only sleep when I'm not supposed to sleep. And all those things are good and there's experiences, but the reality is that, that God has placed you right where you're at so that you can impact the people right where you're at. That we have neighbors who don't know Jesus. You have neighbors that don't know Jesus. You have coworkers that don't know Jesus. You have classmates that don't know Jesus. You have parents who you sit in the stands and yell at the refs that don't know Jesus. And how personally involved are we in that process? Sometimes it's easier to give the money than it is to share your story. And, and I, I want us to look real quickly at Luke chapter 15. In Luke 15, there's three things that are lost in this stories that Jesus is telling. Talks about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. And we're, we're going to stop this morning at just the first one. The lost sheep. Luke chapter 15 verse 1 says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to Jesus, to him. And they wanted to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained. This is a familiar story, right? They complained. This man, this Jesus, he receives sinners. And aren't you thankful that statement is true? 
that Jesus receives sinners? Because you are one, and I are one. That's what, what Paul was talking about, that God demonstrated his love toward us sinners, that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What a powerful statement that these religious people made, even though they, the intent was not how we can receive it, right? They were mad that Jesus received sinners, and I am glad that Jesus receives sinners. He says he eats with them. Verse 3, so Jesus spoke this peril to them, saying, verse 4, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one, I want you to, if you are highlighting on your, your phone or your tablet or your printed Bible, you ought to circle that word or highlight that word or put an asterisk by that word or star that word. If he loses one of them, does he not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the, what's the next word? One. You might highlight, circle, star, whatever that word as well. You go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me for I found my sheep, which was lost. I say to you, likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over what's the word. Let's do that again. Likewise, I say to you, there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. What's easy for us as church people to focus on is the 99. It's us. What seems to be difficult for us is to focus on the one. And, and so, you know, often we have a word for the year that we want to focus on and this year, the word, anybody guessed it? The word is one. You're so smart. I mean, it's like printed right in front of you. Hey, did you notice that with this sitting here, that now I'm not the only one seeing who's sleeping, that you can look in here and see the reflection of people sleeping? Have you noticed that? One. Luke 15, four. I want, to, I want to challenge you to set your phone alarm or whatever alarm you might have for 1 o'clock. That every day at 1 p.m., your phone would remind you to pray for one person. And our challenge is you got this white and green ping pong ball was that you would... Use this as a representation of your one. What would happen this morning if we, as individuals of this church, made an intentional, persistent, prayerful effort? God, I'm, I'm praying that you would allow me this year to reach at least one person with the gospel. If we would focus on one person to share the gospel with, one person that we're going to intentionally and persistently pray, God, give me opportunity. Give me someone in my life. If you don't already have someone that you would begin praying, God, reveal someone to me, whether that's someone at work, someone in your neighborhood, someone that you play ball with, whatever it might be. God, give me a passion to persistently pursue one person. And to think, as we come to next January, to hear who was your one? And how did you pray for them? And how did God reach them through you? We get so focused on let's reach the world, but God has put you where you are to reach the one. Who is in your life that needs to hear the gospel? So in a moment, I'm gonna have you come up and there's, Sharpies all over the altar here this morning for you to write a name down of someone. If you already have someone, and that you would come up and put it in there. Pray for that one. And in fact, I need to do a second one because this one that I put in is our new neighbors. And... Uh, 
I want both of them to get saved. Right? And I'll be the first to confess, I'm not always a good neighbor. I like to open the garage door, go in and shut the garage door and not say a word. But God's convicted me of that. We got some new neighbors that just moved in and about a month ago we took them crumble cookie because who can say no to crumble cookie, right? And invited them to church. Start praying for them. God, give me an opportunity to see this couple know Jesus. And what did Jesus say? There's more rejoicing in heaven over us who meet together on Sunday morning. God rejoices more over the, the one. Could, could we acknowledge that if, if we could reach the one, what is Jesus saying? There, there's a party in heaven when that happens. I want Hallmark to throw a lot of parties in heaven this year. I want, I want Hallmark to be a part of reaching the one. So the question is very simple this morning. Who's your one? The, the green ball here is to represent, and, and some of you have read the, the uh, shelf down there, it says gospel conversations. So what I want you to do today is take this home with you, okay? And I want this to be a reminder to you to have a gospel conversation. That goes beyond just inviting someone to church. You should invite people to church, and I hope you invite people to church. But it goes beyond, we're, we're not trying to build a church, we're trying to build the kingdom, right? So the most important conversation I can have is not inviting someone to church. It's a good first step. But I want to tell people that Jesus loves them. And if they place their faith in Jesus, he will save them. As I often say, if you know enough to be saved by the gospel, you know enough to share the gospel. Let me say that again. If you know enough to be saved by the gospel, you know enough to share the gospel. Share the gospel. And so next Sunday, what I'm hoping is you'll take this this week. And next Sunday, you're going to come up here and you're going to put before church, after church, during church, I don't know. God allowed me to have a gospel conversation this week. And I pray that at this simple display, thank you, Mitch, for building it, will be a reminder that what are, what are we supposed to be focused on? The one. Jesus went after the one. I read this statement last week. If Jesus ran after me, at least I could do is jog after someone else. Like the gospel came to me on the way to someone else. And I hope it's a challenge to you. Who's your one? And when you pray, God, give me opportunities to share the gospel with someone. Are you guys willing to take that commitment? Yes? Yes. I'm going to ask you to stand and I'm going to pray. And after I get done praying... I'm gonna encourage you, you already have the white ping pong ball coming. There's Sharpies all over. Stefan and the team are gonna lead us in worship. And I'm gonna encourage you to write a name down and put it in display. And every Sunday when you come, we'll be a reminder, am I, am I praying for that person? Here, here's what I'm very convinced of. God wants to reach the lost. Do you agree with that? I mean, he came to seek and save the lost. That was the words of Jesus. Like he put on flesh and dwelt among us so that he could be the sacrifice so that we can have salvation. Jesus wants your friend, your coworker, your neighbor, whoever your one is, Jesus wants them saved more than you do. And if you would persistently and passionately pray, God, give me an opportunity to do that, I'm really convinced God will give you an opportunity. That's why Paul often asks the church, pray that God would give me boldness. Because when you pray for opportunities, God's going to give them. Now you need boldness. I want to share my faith. So after I pray, come forward. You can, maybe, maybe it's best if you want to kneel at the altar and pray for a moment, moment for that person. And then just drop the ball in the display. Would you pray with me? God, I, I thank you for grace. I thank you that the gospel came to me. 
Forgive me, Lord, for being stingy with the gospel. Forgive me, Lord, for letting fear of failure or fear of conversations, whatever it might be that, that, that hinders me from being faithful to share the gospel. Forgive me, Lord, and give me courage, give me boldness. Lord, I pray as a church that we would be prayerfully and persistent to go after the one. Lord, to see this display filled with green gospel conversations. Lord, to see the orange drop in there as people give their life to Christ, to see the blue drop in there as people are baptized. What an exciting opportunity for us as a church to celebrate what you do through us. Lord, we love you. We give this next few minutes to you as we just lean into you. Ask us, Lord, to pursue the lost.